Hello and welcome to another edition of Arizona Wildlife Views. I'm Nathan Gonzalez, Public Information Officer for Arizona Game and Fish Department. And today on Arizona Wildlife Views, bear attacks are rare. Today we focus on how the department handles animal attacks. Plus, a look at the Aquatic Research and Conservation Center and how it's protecting endangered fish. And later, they're a living historic link to Arizona's mining past. But are burrows good for Arizona landscapes and wildlife? These stories and more starting right now on Arizona Wildlife Views. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. At Arizona Game of Fish, our mission is to conserve and protect Arizona's wildlife. So when an animal, such as a bear, becomes accustomed to people for food and water, it can create a real public safety threat. Sometimes the department has to make really tough decisions. Today we focus on the policies behind those decisions and the stories behind the headlines. The stories have been in the papers and the stories are on TV. Bear encounters on the rise across the state in the past few years. Why is this happening? The National Weather Service proclaimed this the fourth driest year in the past hundred. And we are now 22, three years into a prolonged drought. So now you've got a remarkably bad, bad year in a very bad series of years. And, uh, and that doesn't bode well for any wildlife. And bears, when they first come out of hibernation, they're, they act a lot like um, deer for that matter, or elk or, or, or other ungulates, they eat a lot of grass and green forbs are relying on a lot of that because there's not a lot of fruits out or other things that are carbohydrate rich that bears target later in the year. So they came out of hibernation this year and there was virtually nothing for them to eat. And that's, that's gonna be a huge problem for those animals. That means they have to move further, work harder, and, and a lot less of them are gonna make it. Uh, when we have those type of conditions. And those movements and the poor conditions just cause them to come into contact with people more frequently in times like this. People can certainly make their lives better by minimizing interactions with bears. If you live in an area where there's a lot of bears, well then bringing your trash and putting it in the garage at night is probably a very important thing to do, as is not leaving out pet food. Your hummingbird feeders, you want to bring those in the house or in the garage at night and your bird feeders. Uh, so removing any potential attractants for those animals are going to go a long way to keeping bears away from your home and minimizing any negative contact with them. The Arizona Game and Fish Department spends considerable time and resources each year to remove or relocate habituated bears to minimize the risk to people. Relocating a bear doesn't always solve the problem. A nuisance bear will only get relocated once as a matter of department policy. A second chance, if you will. As unfortunate as it may be, there's no place you can move a problem animal and have it not be a potential problem. There are people out recreating in every corner of the state nearly every day of the year. And if you move a potentially dangerous animal or a problem animal, it just becomes a problem somewhere else. And bears are very powerful and potentially dangerous animals. And we tend to be rather hard on them because of that. And, and uh, even though it, it hurts us to do that as a wildlife management agency, it's the right thing to do in the name of public safety. And so part of being responsible wildlife managers is making the hard decisions that you don't want to make that's ultimately for the best, not only of the species from time to time, but also what's in the best interest of people. Uh, we've had some bear attacks. We've had some fatal bear attacks. 
Uh, we've had one fatal bear attack, I should say. And uh, attacks from black bears, like attacks from all wild animals, are, are not pleasant things. And, and they're really difficult to work on. I, probably one of the low parts of my career working on that, uh, that fatal bear attack. Uh, I'll never forget it, and I hope to God I never have to do another one. And part of not ever having to do another one is doing the right thing when it comes to public safety and moving bears and treating bears. And so, no fun killing a bear. It's a horrible thing. Nobody gets into the wildlife management business to kill things, but every now and then it's important to destroy animals in the best interest of public health and sometimes in the best interest of the species. It happened maybe five or six years ago. It was a lady, uh, she was out walking her dog up in the Pine Top area and she was attacked by uh, a bear and partially consumed while she was alive. And that's the really horrific thing about black bear attacks. So with black bears when they attack people, a good deal of these happen to be predatory. They're looking to get something to eat. And when they attack people, they don't often kill them. They tend to hold them down and just eat them. That's the reality of the thing. And so uh, that bear was driven off by a, a well-meaning person in a car uh, two times, maybe three times, it was driven off her body while she was still alive. And the bear, um, the bear returned right there with the automobile, lights flashing, horns flashing. Uh, so bear attacks are horrific. I mean, you can't imagine how horrific something like that can be. And, uh, and that's just for us working on them, not to the people and the families of those that were attacked. I think it's important for people to put themselves in our shoes from time to time when we have these difficult management uh, decisions. And part of that is, you know, who wants to be the one to knock on a door and say, Miss Smith, your child was attacked by a bear, or uh, Mr. Jones, your, uh, your wife was attacked while she was out, or whatever it happened to be. And that's the position we get put in with these. And it's a horrible, horrible thing to have to do. And so if it comes down to public safety in an individual animal, unfortunately, the animal's gonna have to be removed. So here at ARC, we hold, spawn, and repatriate our native fish species. This building is secure from wildlife, so we don't get birds eating our fish, or otters, or raccoons. It also runs entirely off of the artesian water. That's fresh water out of the ground that doesn't require a pump to move. It's just bubbling up naturally. Yeah, so our current spawning streams are, like I was saying, pretty much all used military surplus. So these carried external fuel tanks for fighter jets, warheads, other missiles. We have an entire Predator drone tank, which is rigged up as a loach minnow spawning stream. They're extremely functional and ugly. So if you come look in this tank, in 2015, Josh Walters gave us a tour of the Arizona Game and Fish Department's Aquatic Research and Conservation Center. So if we keep going this way, we'll walk past our, our hand-built concrete ponds, which, are, which have been holding up pretty nicely. And we come up to our small retaining wall. So below our small retaining wall is a series of tanks. This is what we had the money to build, but yeah, it's definitely a ghetto right now, it's a fish ghetto. You know? <laughs> We're gonna change it into some high-class condos. Now the facility is getting a makeover, thanks to generous funding from the Federal Bureau of Reclamation. So all of the old military surplus is going to be replaced with real aquatic grade tanks, and all of our new spawning streams will be condensed into this space. So if we walk over here right now- Josh started working here as an intern in 2009. He became a technician, a fish culturist, and now he runs the place. I've always been interested in building stuff. Despite tight budgets, the ARCC has been a laboratory of innovation. So I find it just very satisfying when I 
have a little problem that's been stumping me and I finally solve it. Josh and his colleagues are notorious for finding creative and cost-effective ways to get the job done. They've experimented with using RC airplanes to chase predatory birds away from hatchery fish. And they were early adopters of 3D printing technology. This is a design I made. Josh has designed 3D printed fish feeders and tank management systems, and he fabricated homemade circuit boards needed to run them. Well, now we can walk around the property and kind of look at the bigger picture of what's been completed since you last visited. He even drafted the initial plans for the renovation of the Aquatic Research and Conservation Center. Kind of walk inside the cage. We installed the electric wire on the perimeter fence and the canopy above us. And these are all our new spawning raceways with the tank sump combos. This center trough was installed in phase one, which collects all the water from all of these raceways. The renovation is well underway, and in the summer of 2018, Josh took us on a tour to check out the progress. Uh, just like the previous layout, the water from the two troughs combines and feeds our new ponds. So as you walk out here, so these two PVC line ponds, um, are replacing the older, uh, the two concrete ponds that used to be here. And then over here we have the remaining military shipping containers that used to make up all of our spawning tanks. The perimeter fence now runs around the entire property and has an electric wire on top to make it so raccoons can't get in so easily. That was installed in phase two. Phase one gave us this retaining wall which defines the different levels of the property. We have a new access road to get to our main outflow sump. Basically all of the water from the entire facility is collected in here. Uh, this kind of screens out some of the fish so they don't escape. And then all of this water flows down and meets the outflow of bubbling ponds, which eventually ends up in Oak Creek. So we have this kind of giant open space at the moment and we have plans for installing new raceways down here. Uh, phase three is basically going to give us a new 50 by 70 building. It'll have a bunkhouse, a break room, an imaging lab, a wet lab, and some other storage. The upgrades make it easier for the Aquatic Research and Conservation Center to fulfill its mission of raising endangered native spike dace and loach minnow to replenish wild populations, providing a location to hold wild fish in the event of a fire or some other natural disaster, and conducting much needed research. There is very little information about these species out there. This year we're actually doing a density study for spike dace and loach minnow. The anecdotal data so far is showing that the lowest density tanks have the highest larval fish production. A constant challenge is how to prepare captive raised fish to survive in the wild. So we're raising hatchery fish. Our broodstock are collected from the wild. They adapt to our flake feeds and our crumble feeds and everything within just a period of a month or so. So yeah, the fish that we're stocking out are naive. They don't know what a predator is. They don't know how to forage for food. Chris Starr, the center's research biologist, is in charge of a study to see if it's possible to teach naive hatchery fish to recognize and avoid predators when released into the wild. You know, they're not used to seeing another fish and thinking that's danger. So that's why we're trying to come up with some strategies that we can use to improve the survival once they're stocked out. Thanks to the renovation, the Aquatic Research and Conservation Center is now better equipped to conserve and protect Arizona's native fish. We are on the uphill right now. We're producing more fish than ever before. We hope to just keep the numbers rising, reestablish wild populations everywhere we can. The iconic image of a prospector and his pack burrow wandering Arizona in search of riches is one that has become synonymous with the Old West. 
But fast forward to the 21st century, and while prospectors are few and far between, the burrows they left behind have flourished. Now more than half of all wild or feral burrows in the United States live in Arizona, and their impact is being felt across the state. Dave Conrad is a retired Arizona Game and Fish field supervisor and biological consultant who recently completed an evaluation of feral burrow impacts to wildlife and vegetation in Arizona. Up until 1971, the, the horses and burrows on the landscape were managed in an ad hoc fashion by the individual states with uh, relatively uh, little management. In 1971, um, Velma Johnson, also known as Wild Horse Annie, orchestrated a legislative campaign, a successful legislative campaign, to protect equids on public lands in the United States. And the result of that was the Wild Horse and Burrow Act. That federal law placed the fate of feral horses and burrows under the control of the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service, which began the process of determining the areas where existing herds were considered part of the natural system of public lands. The act has a phrase in it that requires horses and burrows to be managed in a thriving natural ecological balance. Once it was determined which populations could be managed in a sustainable fashion, mm -hmm. then the Bureau and Forest Service needed to determine what the appropriate population size was for each population. Once they determined that a localized herd could be managed sustainably, it was deemed a herd management area with an appropriate number of burrows that the land can handle without undue harm to the environment. Keeping those numbers at a level that sustains ecological balance has become an overwhelming problem. With few natural predators, the burrows double their population about every four years. So areas where the landscape originally could sustain a few hundred burrows is now having to contend with thousands. The Black Mountain herd management area is the largest and uh, has a projected popul burrow population of uh, over 4,000 animals as of 2018. We're seeing severe plant damage in areas as well as fouling of waters from burrows. We can only surmise that it's having serious effects on wildlife in general. The Black Mountain herd population is 1,000 percent over the appropriate management level for burrows in that area. The Black Mountains are also home to the largest herd of desert bighorn sheep in the southwest that now have to compete with the burrows for precious resources. In order to get a clearer understanding of the potential impacts burrows are having on Arizona's wildlife and wildlife habitat, the Arizona Game and Fish Department's research branch is halfway through a three-year study on the issue. Studies that have been done on burrows in the past have been done uh, a little bit here and a little bit there or, you know, in isolated situations looking at very specific questions. And this, as far as we know, this is the first kind of comprehensive attempt to get across the board what are those impacts to the variety of species and, and vegetation. In the Lake Pleasant herd management area, Larissa and her team have developed a grid comprised of one square kilometer plots where they've identified areas with high and low or no known burrows. As part of that controlled study, they're measuring vegetation several ways to identify not only what the burrows are eating, but also the impacts of how they are eating it. This is important to know so the amount of food left for wildlife can be identified. Raised up pretty good. Equids uh, have opposing incisors, which none of the native ungulates have, and they also have a large mouth, and that allows them to eat large quantities of poor quality forage and pass it through their systems quickly. The horses and burrows in North America today were introduced by European explorers in the 1500s. So when our native desert plants began adapting after the last ice age, about 12,000 years ago, they did not evolve to withstand the type of excessive grazing pressure caused by non-native burrows. Burrows often consume native plants down to the roots, preventing them from growing back, and they strip bark and limbs off trees and consume scarce water resources. 
The evidence shows that burrows will often chase off other wildlife and so um, looking to see you know in those areas that we have say bighorn sheep over in the Lake Havasu area you know are the burrows essentially keeping the sheep away from our water sources and stressing the sheep those those are also impacts that we'll try to get a handle on either through trail cameras or, or direct observations or tracks or that kind of thing. The hope is that, that this just gives us good empirical data to be able to then take that to like the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management that has jurisdiction for the burrows and to argue, you know, hey, we need to reduce, we need to pull, you need to trap burrows and pull them out, set them up for adoption here, or they're okay here, they're within the approved management levels, that kind of thing. The BLM estimates there are well over 6,000 burrows in Arizona, but that only represents the number they believe are within the herd management areas. It doesn't include all the burrows that have wandered and reproduced outside of those designated zones. Arizona has seven federally identified herd management areas that cover 2.3 million acres across the western part of our state. And so far, the only tool the BLM has been able to use to control populations is to remove some animals and either hold them in facilities or try to adopt them out to a willing public. So we have a wild horse and burrow event going on today where we have about 40 animals that are available for adoption. Some are available for sale. The horses at this event in Wickenburg were gathered from Utah and Nevada, and the 12 burrows are from Arizona. John Hall is the Wild Horse and Burrow State Lead for the Bureau of Land Management, and he's doing all he can to make these animals easier for the public to adopt. So all of these burrows here that are behind me are from our prison training program in Florence. So all these guys have been in there for, well guys and girls, have been in there for about, I think a month and a half. Um, they're all trained to uh, be haltered, stand tied, pick up their feet, they'll trailer load. Some of them are pack trained. I think even one or two of these are even cart trained, so they'll drive a cart, essentially. Prisoners who have been selected through an application process work with the animals, and it's an arrangement that is proving beneficial to both man and beast. After a while, you get a bond with them, and it's great. You know, but it, it's it's very patient. You know, they have their times where you know it's not fun at all. But then there's it's times where it's great. Responsibility. You know, it teaches you a lot of responsibility. You know, um, that I didn't have much of when I was on the outs. But it, you know, team role. You know, because a lot of this stuff training is a team effort. But um, a lot of I've learned a lot from this. They're awesome. <laughs> They're, they really are very loyal and loving. Um, they, make, they make great companion animals. Um, they make great pack animals. You know, burrows like this guy right here, he's big and sturdy. He can carry a lot of weight. He'll make a great pack animal for someone. And um, a lot of people just really love them. I mean, I love my burrows. They're, they're great. They're, uh, they're a little loud sometimes, but they're easy keepers too. Um, they're, they're really a good pet. They, they require quite a bit less maintenance than a horse. Horses and burros are available for adoption year-round at their holding facility in Florence. And the BLM has also implemented a national online adoption system to help increase the chances of more burros finding homes. We typically, straight adoption out of Arizona, we typically adopt around 50 head. Um, this year we're already getting close to that, so fiscal year. Um, so I'm hoping to actually get closer to 75 to 100 head this year in Arizona though. But we as a state really provide three quarters of the boroughs for the rest of the adoption system across the country. For instance, last year I think I shipped out, I think 150 boroughs I shipped out to other facilities last year. Um, this year I've already shipped 100 boroughs out and I've got a shipment of 50 boroughs going out on Monday to other adoption facilities across the United States so that um, that demand that exists there for boroughs, we're in Arizona trying to fill it. Wendy Ross found exactly what she was looking for at this event. Look at that. I've wanted a borough for a long time. We had one when, when we were growing up and I loved him. So we moved here, I decided I needed to have one or two. But even with all their efforts, the adoption process is not making a dent in the overpopulation problem. 
The Wild Horse and Burrow Act allows a wide range of management options to return populations to appropriate levels, including the sale of excess animals without stipulations and humane euthanasia of unadoptable animals. But so far, Congress has been unwilling to approve the funding for these actions. The only other alternative that's been looked at is um, contraceptive treatments on the range. And that's been shown to be effective under limited circumstances. So even widespread application of contraceptive methods would not provide any relief for decades. It is the role of the Arizona Game and Fish Department to conserve, protect, and manage more than 800 wildlife species within the state. But because of the federal law, they have no jurisdiction to manage burrows, even when they pose a threat to native species and their habitat. There is a place for free-roaming burrows on the Arizona landscape, and they can coexist with native wildlife, but only if their numbers do not exceed the land's capacity to support them. Until next time, I'm Nathan Gonzalez, so get out there and enjoy those Arizona wildlife views. To subscribe to Arizona Wildlife Views magazine, which includes the Arizona Wildlife Views calendar, call 1-800-777-0015 or visit www.azgfd.gov magazine.